Hi everyone, it's Professor Sansom, and this is our uh, pre-lab lecture for Experiment 10, the Synthesis and Analysis of Coordination Compounds. I hope you guys are staying home and staying safe uh, during this uh, quarantine sort of period. Um, we're going to talk about uh, coordination compounds today. So we have several goals. Um, first, describing the formation of coordination compounds in terms of the bonding that happens and how ligands interact with the metal ions. Calculating quantities of reactants necessary to produce a certain amount of product, so like stoichiometry, and also calculating percent yield and potentially discussing the way experimental errors might affect the measured yield. Uh, we want you to be able to measure the spectrum of a coordination compound and identify the wavelength of maximum absorption, the lambda max, and then rank ligands by strength using spectroscopic data. Those two, since you aren't going to be in the lab, we have data files and um, some a video that we'll share with you. Um, and so th those you'll do sort of virtually, not in real life. And um, today we'll be using critical thinking for our process skill. Okay, so we'll start off with what is a coordination compound? A coordination compound is formed when ligand molecules or ions surround a metal cation with empty d orbitals. So you can see here that we have this metal cation in the middle and the dashed red lines show the ligand metal interactions. And we call these coordinate covalent bonds. They're different than traditional covalent bonds because in a traditional covalent bond, each bonding partner brings one electron to the shared bond. But in a coordinate covalent bond, both electrons of the bond actually come from one of the two bonding partners. In this case, the ligand. The metal ion in the middle has no valence electrons, um, so it has empty orbitals. And uh, the ligand will usually have a negative charge, or if not a negative charge, it has to have a lone pair. So for example, this oxygen does have a negative charge and also three lone pairs. And this nitrogen has a no negative charge, but it does have the lone pair. And it donates the lone pair into this new bond, the coordinate covalent bond that's formed. One of the things that's really cool about coordination compounds is that they tend to be really beautiful. They make lots of different colors depending on which metals you use, which ligands you use. And um, this happens because the ligands interact with the d orbitals on the metal and it splits the orbitals into different energy levels. I'll show you a picture of what this looks like in a minute, but you'll remember when you did in Chem 105, all of your five d orbitals were all sort of in a straight line next to each other because they all had the same energy. But it turns out in this situation, uh, the d orbitals actually separate into uh, different levels, two different levels. Um, and electrons are able to jump between the levels, uh, meaning they can get excited and go up to the higher level or fall back down to the lower level. And the energy associated with that is generally in the visible range, um, which is why they will appear colored when we look at them. So let's look at the d orbital splitting. Um, our five d orbitals, um, in this case, we're looking only at octahedral complexes in our experiment today, are split where we have three on the bottom and two on the top. You'll notice the three on the bottom are the three orbitals where the, the body of the orbital, the electron density, is not on the axis. It's actually in between the axes. Um, and that's true for all three of these. Whereas the two that are in the higher level, they have electron density right on the axis. The easiest one to see is the dz squared. You can see that um, right on the z axis. Because they have electron density on the axes, when ligands approach in an octahedral formation, which means they're all approaching from the axes, what happens is there's some electron-electron repulsion between the electrons that are in that ligand that are going to make the new covalent bond and the electrons that are in the d orbital already on the metal. And so that destabilizes these orbitals that are in the higher uh, energy level here 
and makes these a little bit more stable relative to the higher energy ones. So again, the reason that happens is because of the geometry here. Because it's octahedral, the ligands are actually approaching into the same places where these d orbitals already exist. And that makes them uh, have electron-electron repulsion and makes them destabilized. Now, the degree to which they are destabilized depends on a number of things. Uh, so one of the most important things is ligand field strength, which is how much those ligands are going to destabilize those d orbitals. The stronger or the, the larger the ligand field strength, the more these d energy uh, d orbitals are going to be split apart from each other in energy. So for example here, we've got three different ligands. They are each binding, but they cause different amounts of disruption or electron-electron repulsion when they're binding to the metal. And uh, so they're actually absorbing different colors. So just to review from what we've learned about before, if these things are absorbing red, green, and violet respectively, what colors should they appear? Go ahead and pause the video and think about that for a minute, and then I'll tell you the answers. Okay, you may remember that if something is absorbing one color, it will appear the opposite color on the color wheel. So if it's absorbing red, it should appear green. If it absorbs green, it should appear red. If it absorbs violet, it should appear yellow. This is just a really fancy color wheel, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, and showing the opposites that exist between them. Okay, so this is what a spectrum might look like for one of the coordination compounds that you're going to synthesize in lab, where it has this peak over here. It's actually in the infrared, but it has significant absorbance in the red into the orange. Um, and so what color would this appear if we were looking at it? Well, we're probably going to see the color that's transmitted, which is like this blue, blue-green color here. Now, what if we had a stronger field ligand or a weaker field ligand? Which way do we expect the peak to shift? To the left or to the right and why? Think about that for a minute and pause the video. Okay, if we had a stronger field ligand, then we would expect that it would result in a higher energy difference between the d orbital levels. And so the energy of the light that is absorbed would be higher. And if the energy of the light is higher, it would move from the red towards the blue to higher energies. And so it might be shifted to the left. If we had a weaker field ligand, it might be shifted to the right towards lower energies. Okay, now we're gonna talk about the chelation effect. So this is something that you probably heard about in Chem 106. Um, so we have two examples here where we have an iron ion. And in the example on the left, six water molecules are binding. They're all binding by an oxygen. Um, on the right, we have three oxalate ions, um, C2O4, two minus ions, and notice that each one binds in two different places. Now, the question is, which of these is more favorable and why? This is a hard question, so I want you to think about um, two things, enthalpy and entropy. Uh, one of these guys, it turns out, uh, is very hard to make go in the opposite direction. It's hard to undo it once it happens, um, meaning that it's very favorable for it to form. And uh, one of them is more easier to undo if it happens. You could add a different ligand and it would just replace the thing that's there. So if we think about the enthalpy of these interactions, we're making this coordinate covalent bond between oxygen atoms and our iron ion. And over here, we're doing basically the same thing. Uh, it's a little different because this oxygen is bonded to a carbon and this oxygen is bonded to a hydrogen, but we actually anticipate that the enthalpy will be approximately equal. 
Um, but thinking about if we go from the left one to the right one, how many particles are constrained in this ion on the left? We actually have seven particles, the ion and the six water molecules that are bound to it that are all constrained in this configuration in space uh, when they're in this complex ion, which is um, a low entropy state. It's an ordered state. And over on the right, instead, we just have four molecules or four particles that are constrained, the iron ion, and then each of these three oxalate ions. And that means we actually would have also released three more water molecules um, back into the solution so they could move around, um, and that would increase the entropy. So the picture on the right of our oxalate uh, complex ion, that demonstrates something that's more favorable and the reason it's more favorable is not because of enthalpy, but rather because of entropy. So there's two different kinds of strengths that you talk about with uh, ligands. One of them is field strength, ligand field strength, and one of them is the chelation effect. The field strength is controlled by the electronegativity of the ligand molecules or ions. So it has to do with how well they donate electrons. Things that are better at donating electrons or stronger Lewis bases are going to be better ligands, have a larger field strength. This has to do with the enthalpy of the interaction between the ligand molecules and the metal ion itself in that coordinate covalent bond. The second thing that we talk about is chelation effect, with, and this has to do with the K of formation. Um, if you have molecules that are bidentate or polydentate, meaning they can bind in multiple locations on the metal ion, then that means that fewer molecules get constrained, and that's favorable in terms of entropy. And so that makes the formation of that complex ion very favorable, and it makes it difficult to reverse it. In other words, the K of formation, the equilibrium constant for the formation of that complex ion would be very large. And the delta G for the formation would be very negative, which also means the delta G for the reverse would be very positive or very unfavorable. So chelation is one of the methods that uh, people will use when, for example, you've ingested a heavy metal, they will give you a chelating agent that will bind to the metal ions and prevent them from causing damage to your organs. Okay, that's everything that we've got to talk about today. Thanks for listening and good luck with this week's experiment.